So we'll just jump right in. Our earlier session focused on the resiliency and sustainability of our cities, which manifests itself from the effectiveness and efficiency of our physical infrastructure. Uh, but the ultimate goal of our investments and our innovation should be on the less tangible elements of our cities, the, the health, the equity, and the vibrancy of those communities and the growth and well-being of the people who work and reside within them. These less tangible elements of our cities are dependent on access to resources, services, and opportunities by the entire population, no exceptions. Without a focus on equity and inclusion, we limit our city's ability to meet the needs of an evolving populace. The future of smart cities requires a diversity of thought focused on empowering and enabling all rather than just the few. While urban planning and architecture will not solve these problems alone, they do set the stage for the evolution of opportunity in our cities and provide a vital framework for encouraging and promoting justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in our world. So with that introduction, I'd like to open up um, to our panelists uh, a brief opportunity to introduce themselves and we'll just really jump right into to our panel on equity and inclusion in, in, in smart cities. We can just run right down the list. I saw Ryan was first. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Solid. Uh, my name is Ryan Alexander Thomas. I am co-founder and CEO of Humanity. Uh, we've created an online platform for connecting and coordinating communities using real-time actionable insights. So everything you may need from project management, event management, to tracking resources and donations, all of those can now work together in one space so that we can solve our goals collectively. Um, a lot of the talk earlier just reminded me sort of why we started the company, this idea that we can generate tremendous amounts of data, but unless we actually utilize that data for this collective benefit, if we can't work together to establish equity, then really what is it all for? So I'm looking forward to talking with everybody today, what we can do to ensure technology is incorporated for diversity and inclusion in every community. I'm used to following Ryan. Ryan was uh, a part of our fabulous uh, Smart and Resilient Cities Accelerator for the ION. I am Courtney Cogdell. I am the program manager for our Accelerator Hub. Uh, we have one accelerator that focuses on smart city technology. We do that in partnership with the Office in of Innovation at the City of Houston. And then our newest accelerator is um, focused on minority business enterprises in the aerospace world. So um, very exciting things. Houston, I can't wait to talk about what we're doing here, as well as I'm going to apologize in advance for my coworkers, aka my dogs. They have yet to learn um, Zoom etiquette and sometimes interrupt me as well as the panel. So if you hear them, um, trust me, they'll get written up later. So excited to be here. Hi, I'm Kimberly LeGrew. I'm the CIO of the City of New Orleans. Uh, we are considered a smart city. Um, and for us, smart has been a very data centric focused um, way of governing our city, uh, bringing information to our decision makers, uh, primarily for the recovery of New Orleans on several fronts. So whether it was post Katrina, during the pandemic, hard rock collapse, cyber recovery, we've had to recover uh, multiple incidents and we see data as a driver for that. Uh, smart city to me is always an informed city and an informed environment. So uh, excited to hear about Houston and, and Ryan and their efforts uh, because for us, we have not gotten to the place where as someone mentioned, scaling up these uh, IOT and smart city projects, they do exist in pockets. So, uh, learning about the fundamentals of designing those things is uh, really exciting for us, but um, here to talk about uh, how we stay smart and how we continue to grow a smart ecosystem in our city. Thank you all. Really excited for this panel. Um, similar to the first one, I'd like to start it off with a prompt for all of you and then we'll just roll from there. So for decades, we've heard uh, public acknowledgement of racial, social, economic, and opportunity inequity that exists in our cities and our communities. And while some progress has been made, we still have a long way to go. What key role do you all see smart, uh, smart policies, smart buildings, and smart infrastructure playing in the development and progress of just to the equity, diversity, and inclusion in our cities? 
So I'll, I'll, I'll give uh, my two cents real quick. Um, one, that's a very large question. So <laughs> what role does you know, technology buildings and everything play in, in equity? And I, I think what Kim mentioned when how uh, New Orleans approaches um, equity is from that that data that data centric perspective, which is um, we're really only going to be able to make better decisions if we have better information. So the role to me that technology buildings and, and any other device and you know the IoT network infrastructure or any crowdsourcing platform, the the ultimate goal is to ensure that the best decision can be made for as many people as possible. So so. I think there needs to be something said about the digital divide when it comes to uh, generating this information. Because yes, if we knew how many people were in a particular building or on a particular street, we can route traffic, we can control temperatures, we can do all of these things to benefit those people. But if all people aren't participating in generating this valuable data, then again, are we actually benefiting all people? We only have a subset of our people who's where this data is coming from. And very often that is, you know, those are those that aren't experiencing the digital divide, but rather are in more affluent areas, you know, as a lot of these pilots, you know, tend to be. So I think there's more, less of a role, but more of a responsibility for technology and smart buildings and the smart infrastructure is that they have to consciously make a decision to be more inclusive, which means putting the information, putting those sensors, giving the technology and tools to those who are, you know, experiencing, um, you know, some th those th different forms of oppression. So, I know this is a super long answer. I told you I was going to be brief, so I apologize. But yeah, in, in short, I, I think that that role is making sure that we have the data from everyone with, within the community that that's in question. So I'll, I'll tail on Ryan and Ryan, that was actually very brief for you. I'm very proud of you. Ryan <laughs> was, um, we worked a lot on the brevity of, cause he has such a knowledge and such a way to share it. So um, very important thing you noted and, and many have noted during this discussion today is about data and what are we doing with that? And so much of why I love Houston and I think what the ION is doing and really connecting these communities, but using data to do so. We um, have a lot of data from a sociologist, uh, Stephen Kleinberg. So he runs a organization at Rice University and over the last 38 years, he has taken economic demographic and cultural landscape surveys and has found out that Houston has become a magnet for these new divergent streams of integration and really Houston is on the cusp of being the most amazing and transformative city in the 21st century. And I know that's a lot of bragging rights for Houston, but, um, and I know we're here with, with other cities, but really Houston is taking this data and connecting the communities, like Ryan said, that need it most, that are really out there and, and not just the affluent, not just the communities that have the infrastructure, but having a mayor and a city that is connected to the mission of transforming this and, and making sure that that digital divide is, is no longer there, or at least really trying to bring the right people to the table and, and educating and providing that workforce development and teaching the community. And that's all about providing that resource and having the right data to do so. And I'll just chime in on the, the last piece of this because those answers are just perfect and say almost everything that I would say. Um, it is uh, smart being an informed city. Uh, tech has been touted as the great equalizer. It's actually an enabler um, and it, it can enable all societies, right? Uh, so from the, um, uh, from people with disabilities to uh, people with low literacy rates, uh, tech can help in every, every one of those aspects. It just has to be delivered responsibly. It has to be an ostensible part of the way that we live. And uh, so not as much as uh, an equalizer, the enabler, the piece where we enable is through access. So um, if everyone doesn't have access, once we have the information and we know where for a city like New Orleans, where our pockets of uh, our digital deserts are, 
are where digital redlining is happening. So where uh, telcos and other companies refuse to make investments in communities because those communities don't drive a lot of economic value. So the pilots, as you mentioned, go somewhere else, right? But we are trying to build a smart infrastructure and infrastructure has to be strategy. It's about making sure that there is a conduit to those places, to the communities that need it. And without that infrastructure, without the foundation, as you all actually bring and consider design and the foundational pieces of delivery of technology, without that foundation, people really can't participate. So you've got to make the investments in the smart infrastructure and look at strategic ways to bring it into communities so people can participate. And the thing about a smart building that I, that I really love is um, you take that smart infrastructure and you bring it to an area where there is um, there needs to be some equalizing, where we need justice and equity, and then you get to serve, you get to target a population of people, you get to serve a specific need. So in a housing development or in a, a community where we've got a um, multi-service center or um, public safety needs or issues, bringing those technologies there and then addressing what they really need, whether it's literacy or um, accessibility um, or just the learning about how to use those skills. Those things are integral parts of, of how we bring, bring equitable solutions into our communities. And cities are great because they impact people, like uh, working with a, an architectural group and the design of a city and managing traffic and studying those things, the, the mayors and the, the city staff, they really get to make an impact on people's daily lives that you cannot make at the federal or the state level. You know your, your populations and your people. So that direct impact uh, is one of the things that really excites me about the work that we do here. Like we really could make a difference if we take the information that we have and we manage our data and then we put that into infrastructure and places where people live to help them. And that's where the impact really is. That's great. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there's a couple of things that I heard there. You know, one thing that, that you had said, Ron, was um, that this isn't a role, it's a responsibility. And, and I think that's, that's a brilliant part, right? I, I think that uh, in design professions, sometimes we, we mistake obligation for opportunity. And, uh, and when we look at the health and well being of communities, that is an obligation of our profession. Um, when we look at this idea, um, the, the idea of technology and data being enablers to, uh, to how we create inclusion in our community, um, I, I think that there's two things that, from an architectural of planning and, and really a, a regulatory or a legislative, um, stance that that we need to address one being that the that it, our ability to be equitable and inclusive starts with an acknowledgement and a proactive discovery of how or where we are failing to provide the right resources and the right infrastructure um, I think that that that's really um, kind of a foundational component to us being able to move forward with uh, with, with really building um, healthy communities. And so with technology innovation and technology maturity coming to a, a space where it does have the opportunity to, to really um, influence our, our ability to deliver healthy environments and healthy communities, um, where is or where do you all see the most beneficial investment in infrastructure for us as uh, as a profession or really as, as a kind of community that's developing and overseeing and managing the built environment. So I'll, I'll jump in here and talk a little bit about what the, the ION um, here in Houston is new. So it's the beginning of an innovation corridor. And so what is, um, what is that exactly is probably the question. It is connecting because Houston and Texas, you know, everything's bigger and better in Texas. And one other thing is everything is very spread out in Texas because Texas is the flattest state I've ever lived in. So this is a way of connecting physically the largest medical center in the world, the biggest university in Texas, and 
the parts of the community known as third ward here in Houston and the area surrounding it that needs these resources most. And what did that mean from a building's perspective? It meant renovating a Sears building that had been here since the forties. And that meant putting a hundred million dollars of money from the Uni Rice University built starting this project and renovating and trying to keep the infrastructure and the, and the really what that building has meant to Houston and building upon it, making it better. So the responsibility would be making sure that those keystones in a community and those things, I get that designing the new, amazing, cool spaceship looking building might be appealing, but really making sure it's true to the DNA of the community. You want to come in and invigorate what's already there. Coming in and making something completely different may not engage the community than it needs to do. And that's really what the ION's mission and vision really is, is connecting those communities surrounding it and making sure that they feel welcome having that open door and, and having somewhere to go and being in that vision and vision. Oh, I would agree. Um, and I, I would say that my responsibility as a, as a CIO representative of the city is to call that out, to say, these are the areas and these, these are where the needs are. Um, it is our responsibility to deliver that type of information to the designers, right? Um, we, our role is to say these are the needs and present ways or present the needs to the communities um, and work with them to implement designs that uh, serve, that actually address the needs that we have. But we have to be honest. We have to not have our feelings on our shoulders about those things. Um, as a city, we, you know, we have to just recognize that, that we have needs and some that we have not addressed for years and years, right? And then we have to say, uh, let's be realistic about whether or not, as you mentioned, Courtney, whether or not a new building is what would best serve this community. Is, is that what they really need? Uh, can I put a, a state-of-the-art building in a community where the literacy rate is perilously low, right? Can I give them tools without a way for them to use the tools that, that I'm presenting there. So in, in a design, uh, my responsibility really is to communicate to you all what the needs are um, for the people that you would be designing for. You know, I, I think that's right. And looking at where that investment can be made, um, I, I'm, I'm taken back to something that Indy said, you know, during that, during his uh, opening presentation, which is, how can we increase the value of parts of our community when you're looking at having a tree lined street, how that would increase it by, you know, several thousand dollars. Um, homelessness and housing is, is, a, is a critical issue um, and one that can be addressed from a lot of different areas. One of those is how can we as a community work together to ensure that our you know, constituents have access to affordable housing. But once they do have that affordable housing, something that we learned um, you know, when meeting with Colden for the Homeless and several of these other institutions is that it's not just getting someone a house. It's when they have a house, well, now they need pots, they need pans, they need community. Very often who are recently home return to homelessness on their because they want to be with their people because they need food and that's where they know they're going to get food. So when you're looking at creating or investing money in uh, infrastructure to solve these, these issues within the community, um, part of that is the building. And then the other part of it is, well, what is the collateral damage, you know, from just putting money in this one area? What else is needed in order to fix sort of the systemic issue ra rather than, okay, well, we, we put money, we raise the value of this one building, it looks nice, but then how does that really impact the community? It goes back to what Kim was saying is, you know, it's, it's being able to communicate um, effectively what is happening within the community um, something that, you know, uh, Cordy and I, we've, we've talked about um, back when I was over at the Accelerator is how do you communicate what the community thinks about a particular investment? Because the uh, you know, fact of the matter is the first investment may not be the, the best one. We have to learn. We're probably going to invest in a few different areas. That's why we have these pilots to figure out sort of how does the community responding to these particular investments? So I, I think the most critical investment is the one with the most information. And that's only going to occur when we start really looking at how are all these different uh, issues tied together. 
I am curious though, Ryan, you made a great point and, and Kimberly about information. So I know from Houston standpoint where we as an accelerator for smart city technology take a lot of what we're doing from the climate action plan or the resiliency plan that a city has put, you know, umpteen hours of research and everything into. How much is that being taken into consideration when looking to work with communities or work in certain areas and, and build there and, and help those communities? Well, I, well, I'll tell you, um, and we have a resiliency plan. We've got a master plan. We've, we created so many plans after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, like we really wanted to know. And we continue to update those, those plans, right? Uh, so we, we see we, and we hear what our communities, uh, we know, right? We've gathered that information, but we were embarking on a few projects uh, and they were around stormwater management um, and how we would design stormwater reservoirs in our city. And we started to see that residents didn't want that because we hadn't communicated very effectively how that would help them. So um, as I mentioned before, we can't be sensitive about what this information shows us. Um, we, we have to let people tell us um, whether these plans work for them or how we are communicating those plans. And we need uh, to have those open dialogues with not just the residents, but, but our design community, right? And we need to say that while we need to build stormwater management, the people are really concerned about the potholes. So while we're addressing this part of our need, can you help us with these other parts? because I can't just give you the piece of paper that I developed three years ago without finding out how the community really feels about that and how it's being perceived in the community and whether or not the design actually meets the need of, of our folk. And we as a city can't do that without, uh, without their feedback and without uh, listening honestly at, uh, at what they have to say. I think, um, I mean, this is, um, these are transparency and uh, engagement become so critical to understanding the, the true needs of a community. And I, I, I think when we look to obviously the history uh, and the shortcomings of, of urban planning, of policy, uh, of, um, and even of, of development, um, it's always been a very one-sided uh, top-down approach. And I think rectifying uh, a, a lot of the, the misadventures that, that we've had, right? The, 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 really the inequity that's been built in to the systems from the start um, is such a, well, it's, it's, it's a lot to untangle. And so when we look to data and the data sets that we're using, when we look to the opportunities and the infrastructure and the engagement we have with our communities, um, I'm just, uh, I guess, I'm, I'm wondering from the standpoint of, um, of uh, either the AIA as an industry partner or architects or firms or engineers, um, what are the opportunities we have or what would you see as the opportunities to be more involved, more engaged with cities as they rethink the, their infrastructure as they rethink opportunity. Uh, you know, you talked you talked about the innovation corridor. What are the the real priorities that we can focus on to um, to prioritize a, a redevelopment or a, a, let's say a rethinking of development in our communities that is wholly focused on on supporting and building more opportunity. For, for everyone, the, the entire population of, of that community. I think it was brought up earlier in the in the previous panel about the top down and the, the grassroots up, right? Like there's that issue with the, the connection and how do you get there and, and what do you do? And I think Houston stumbled and fell and, and I'm sure Kimberly and, and you stumbled and fell with your city as well. And you kind of figure out what they need along the way. But I think a pivoting point was when Houston was up, I mean, we're the fourth largest city in the US, right? We were up for an Amazon bid and you would think we were gonna make it high on the list, be on the short list. We weren't, we were kicked out very early because we didn't have the infrastructure, because we didn't have 
the communities there. And partially because we're so spread out because we didn't come together and say, wait a minute, is everyone not working together because we're not closer together? Or is it because there isn't a community? Well, the answer came out saying, we're just not geographically in the right spot. And that took you know, a really big hit to the Houston's confidence. I mean, like Amazon deserves to be here. We're Houstonians and, and we have great everything to offer, but it was figuring out that that infrastructure from that base level wasn't there. And we didn't have the right engagement from the community and from the people that had the most buy-in from the universities, from that top point, and then from the grassroots. What are startups doing? What is the city doing to support this technology and support its growth? And we're very lucky to have a mayor that's very invested in climate action and, and what we're doing. I mean, we're known for oil and gas. And if we don't get them under control, how are we gonna control you know, our pollution and, and be here in a hundred years to come? So it's really about finding that sweet spot where both the grassroots and the upper people say, you're right, there's a problem and we need to find a way to come together to fix it. No, yeah, that's absolutely right. And how do you ensure, cause I'm looking at the chat and um, Victor you know, made, made, the, made the point, you know, this Henry Ford quote, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for a you know, faster horse. And it, that, that really does, you know, again, circle back to this issue, which is, do the people themselves know, quote unquote, what's best for them? Or do the people who are decision makers know what's best? And you can't have one without the other. Because when you have people that are dealing with an issue, they are more focused on their immediate needs versus long-term solutions. That's just a fact of the matter. If somebody's experiencing homelessness, they're not really concerned with a 20-year plan for the infrastructure within the city. They're looking for food and a place to sleep. At the same time, you have people who are decision makers that again, want to make sure people have food that day, but also have to figure out, do we, do we have an affordable housing issue? Is it that there isn't enough transportation for people to have jobs, they can't maintain them, therefore can't pay rent, and therefore now uh, can, you know, are experiencing homelessness? Is it that homes are destroyed due to natural disasters and we need to really think about our irrigation and, and living with water? Right, so there's there's many different decisions that have to come into uh, to come into play, but I, I think the way forward has to be um, something that I believe it was in 2017. Um, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation they had it they had a symposium where they were talking about um, what what is really this future of philanthropy, and and really um, this ties into uh, the Smart City Initiative, which is we recognize that there are some issues, but we have to be able to do more than just have a conversation, right? We have to really be able to take action. Um, but I, th I think that the first part about this is we, we have to have this conversation about what should we be building and who, who is this affecting? We need a better way to really facilitate that. And then as Kim mentioned, we need a better way to convey the necessity for this because most people who in, in a city aren't data scientists. They really aren't going to look into the 20, 50 and 100 year plans for cities, let alone even five years, right? At the same time, you have a lot of the decision makers who d don't, they can't, there's no way for them to experience every single thing that everyone within the city is experiencing. So we need a better way for people who, pe there's few decision makers to have aggregated information about how people truly feel about these about these these changes, whether it's policy, whether it's new infrastructure or investments being made. At the same time, the everyday person needs a better way to know what are the projects within my community that are actually being built. Because a lot of people just don't know what's going on. There there are several projects uh, that the city is implementing that people have no idea. Wait, when are you going to fix that park? It's like, well, actually, if you look at our budget, we're actually going to fix that park Q2 of this year, right? People people simply don't know. So we need a way for all members of the community to one have that conversation, and then once we know, okay, what are the collective goals that we have? How can we collaborate? collaboratively take action to ensure that these goals are met, whether it's short-term or and or long-term. Totally agree. Uh, so uh, 
and it's a multifaceted approach, I believe, you know, and one thing that was mentioned earlier today, we can't leave the business community out. We can't leave out our, our chambers of commerce and, and the, the people who actually drive the economics because they have to be our champions. So got to help them understand either a what's in it for us or how can they thrive in these communities where we want to make these investments? That's one thing. And we need the grassroots organizations because they represent so many of the voices that we don't hear. And then we need to educate our citizens responsibly. Uh, we gotta, gotta find the right way to talk to them. Uh, we learned in the city um, that even during the pandemic, uh, the message was clear, but we weren't sending the message out by the right folk, right? They didn't wanna hear from the medical community uh, about wearing a mask. They wanted to hear from the mayor that when she said wear a mask and people didn't wear a mask, she was going to enforce that. That's what they wanted to know, right? So we were putting doctors on the television and the doctors weren't making any traction with our residents. Uh, so understanding the ways that we can communicate with people and that's where design comes in. That's where we say, this is what people will need to, to hear this and give us the input. Whether it's Zoom, and Zoom has become the, the medium, but 50 years ago, it was a telephone and then everyone could get information. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, your school sent information to your house, right? And that's how your kids, that's how you knew what was happening in a school. Well now, uh, and then there was email. And if you had a literacy issue, you, you weren't really in the communication game. Now we've got a collaboration tool and we are talking face to face. Everyone has a cell phone, but what if we change the game? What if we switch the platform and we're not using Zoom, we're using WebEx or BlueJeans or something a little more sophisticated. We can alienate groups of people right there. And then we say, oh, we're not hearing from them or they don't have the representation. And it's not that they're not engaged. So we have to uh, make sure that our approach just covers every every place and we get the feedback and then we have you've got to have design i think in every one of those elements so whether it is at the neighborhood level whether it is at the the business and our economic community level or whether it is in the literacy place i think they, they you have to be involved in all of those aspects i think that's uh, i mean this is a, a fascinating conversation and and when we put it into the perspective there's there's um to put it in the perspective of uh i guess what has traditionally driven uh development and engagement in the city being much more along the lines of of self-interest and when i say self-interest it's that could be business self-interest right private uh, private growth, whether that's personal or, or um, business or community. But the, the reality is we're, we are shifting to, um, a, a, I guess, a, a vision for our future that is much more about collective self-interest. And I, I think when, when, Ryan, when you talked about if we give somebody a house who is homeless, there, there's, that, that's great. You've given them a resource that they can occupy but it doesn't take care of the stability the 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 sense of community the known process for achieving all of the other needs that they have um whether that's getting food you know getting um well any any type of uh, communication or any type of, of engagement and relationship those are things that 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 are brought by the community and so when we think of making decisions, the, the idea of um, a collective good um, really ties back to this idea of um, public-private partnerships. And when we think about influencing um, decision makers uh, with the sentiment of, you know, good for all versus good for some, um, that's a a really hard transition to make and I don't know if you all have ideas or uh, good examples for people to to look to because I think that is one of the areas that um, we always look to ROI right or we look to some investment that is tied much more to that singular uh, benefit and uh, shifting that mindset that 
the more people we can touch, the more people we can benefit, the, the healthier we are long-term, both in terms of community and development. Um, I, I don't know, that's, that's more of a statement than a, than a question, um, because it is, it is foundational, right? That, is, that was the goal of today, is that this is really a systemic um, network of, of decision-making and, and expertise that needs to be brought to the table for us to be able to achieve true equity in our communities. Um, and so with that, I, I don't know that, um, well, architects obviously aren't going to be the foundation of it, but I, I do think that legislation, I do think that technology, and I do think that community at, at its core is foundational to us moving forward. I think Tim brought up a great point earlier, and that was having those conversations that are hard and, and really diving into the data and, and being honest and truthful in that room. And that takes a group of people that we like to say in, in the accelerator is um, assuming positive intent. You come in there assuming that this conversation and everyone in it and you hope that every part of it is, is that API, that you're coming together, assuming positive intent to grow from it and that the information shared is to help the community at large and to help the bigger plan, not the people in it, not that immediate horse you're given, but really that long-term of what a community really needs. And whether that's you know, informing the community, teaching the community, providing workforce development. I mean, our partners with Intel and Microsoft, they're two of our founding partners for the ION as well as Chevron Ventures. They are coming in and they are deeply invested in workforce development and upskilling and reskilling and everything for the community. And so it's, it's facing that, what does the community need and how do we give them that? Not just a part of the community, but the entire community. And what's the goal? The goal is retaining talent. The goal is teaching. The goal is upskilling. It's not about lowering the bar so everyone can be involved. It's about bringing everyone up to that bar so they feel empowered, so they feel that they have that voice and that ability to be a part of the conversation, have a seat at that table and be heard. And, and that's what's so important about these communities and providing information and coming together. Yeah, absolutely. And one, one thing I will, I will add to that is um, this, this, this idea, um, Corey, you, you mentioned earlier, um, this, this public benefit, right? That this idea that how do you establish that ROI or convey an ROI to people participating in working together to improve their community? Um, assuming that we're, we're defining these communities as you know either loosely geographic, this this sense that if I participate in or contribute some way to this community, what do I get out of this? Right? I, I think the way to really to, to 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 expand on that to break that down is to give people a sense of what's really at stake to give them an idea behind if you do contribute in some way you do benefit to give you a, a couple of examples when we were working with um united methodist at bread of life for this this contact tracing this idea that if you participate in contact tracing you actually can reduce the amount of uh, the reduce of COVID spread in your area which would prevent people from dying, right? That's that's just one of those examples of how we can come together to make sure that other people are safe. And the way we did that is we you know, had this marketplace where people could come in and say, I, I have I ex exposed to COVID, I am supposed to stay home, but I do not have access to uh, groceries, I do not have access to other resources such as uh, childcare, whatever it may be, and they go on our platform. In addition to contact tracing, um, you know, with Harris County, they could also say, well, I need food, I need water, I need this. Other people could say, hey, I have extra food, I have this. We have those interme intermediaries to ensure that these resources are, you know, safe to transfer. But when, what you do is you're not just telling people, hey, here's the problem, and you're not just telling people, here's a list of resources, go here to get Get help. What you're doing is you're building that sense of community, and that, that a couple things happen uh, when you do that. Uh, one, you reduce the inefficiencies um, by, by by somewhere close to uh, uh, you know ninety percent. Um, this 
where, where are we supposed to figure out where the food, if water is supposed to go? You, you reduce that roughly 90%. Um, you can increase the rate of people receiving relevant products and services anywhere from 2,000 to 11,000%. Um, when there is this real-time exchange of information, this idea that we were talking about earlier, how do we make sure that the right people are getting the right things, you know, well, starts with the right data, but then two, you also need a platform that's not just a nice graph, but it's something that, okay, I can take action. I will take this to this person at this time. So that's one of those other pieces that we provide. And, and this is part of that larger conversation of um, how do we um, ensure that we're, we're benefiting people and how can we convey the benefits of this, whether you were coming from the design side or whether you're coming from the architecture or your uh, ag tech, biotech, whatever it may be, it, it starts with creating that community, right? It, it starts with one, which is one or, or many stakeholders coming together and saying, here, here are our people, here is our area, here are the issues that we are dealing with. And when you're talking about Kim, you know, bringing in the Chamber of Commerce, right? You're talking about bringing in those those multinational or local nonprofits. You're talking about bringing the businesses. You're talking about bringing in the people who are designing the schools and the parks and and everything, to really just lay it out there and say, what what are we facing right now from the systemic issue to the daily um, pressures that people face, and and how can we now collectively um, work, work together because again, I'm only going to participate if I think it's something in it for me, right? If I'm somebody in the, in the community, you're telling me to donate a hundred dollars every month to this. I don't know what that's doing. Right. But when I can see that we are doing this particular project, because there's a group of people who are disenfranchised because they may not have access to food. They might, they, we don't, we need a grocery store in this area. Or I see that the literacy rate in this particular area that the school my kids went at, why is, my, why is the literacy, literacy rate so low over here and not this area? Oh, this organization is actually gonna have after school tutoring. We're gonna have another session. We may need more, we, we just may need bigger classrooms. We may need, we may need more teachers. We, there's all these different things that that we can learn uh, from the spaces that, that we're, you know, that we're living in, that we're designing, um, and how we can contribute collectively to ensure that our, our, our collective needs are being met. Sorry to uh, belabor the point. Good point, though. And uh, I, I will add one thing to that. Uh, I heard so much of what you said, Ryan. Uh, I, I have to be prepared. Uh, and I think we should all be prepared for those who will never come along with us, right? There are, there are people who will, uh, and uh, Carlos reminded me, not everyone has a cell phone, but not everyone is going to see the benefits of where we want to go, right? So we can't just design for the solution we deliver. We do have to design for needs. And some, sometimes that's going to stop very short of where we expect to get our communities. They're not going to want all of the things that we want for them, right? Uh, we might just get to meet the need, like may not uh, address the growth at that point. And we have to, to know that uh, I need this very basic thing and I'm going to deliver this to you, but I may not get you to the place uh, where you make full utilization of all of these technologies that we have, or that smart, a smart building might just allow you to move safely in your space. And you may never use that, that energy uh, rating or those energy efficiencies. Somebody else might just have to champion those things for, for some of us and, or for some of our people. And we might just need to be looking at meeting their very basic needs. And, and that's not a failure. I don't think that that's a failure. I think that that's a win. And uh, if, if we're able to just understand what the need is, uh, we're, we're really winning. You know, I'm looking back, you know, we, we talked quite a bit about data, um, really the, our ability to leverage the infrastructure, the, the, the community to capture that data whether it be needs, wants, desires. Um, the, the idea of having all of this data available to us really provides us that opportunity for transparency um, to the community, but then it also really influences um, the decisions and outcomes that we're able to deliver. Um, 
with the work that you all are doing, a lot of it is venturing into either reinvention or uh, but let's say true innovation in that we're changing the way that people will engage with um, with community, with systems, uh, whether it be you know housing, banking, um, education. Um, a lot of the 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 influence of data, the the influence of our ability to change in the face of um, new opportunities requires a lot of agility. And that's not something that you know, buildings are really good at, or, or uh, governments are very good at, or infrastructure is really good at. Um, do you see, um, what do you see as the, the risks that come with the need to move much more towards being agile in the way we course correct, right? Because I do agree that at the end of the day, we're always going to be aiming for, you know, a, a, a a lighthouse that's way out there, or we should be anyway. Um, and and we would want to, or we will need to course correct based on how the each initiative um, is delivered and how successful it is within the communities that we deliver it to. I keep going first. I'm not going to go first again. So I'm staying quiet so you guys can go. <laughs> I just talked, so that was great. <laughs> so again, this this is this goes back to some of these some of these earlier points. Um, what what is what is the true what is the true focus of um, of, of what we're of what we're trying to do? And you know, that kind of kind of reminds me why we you know started the company to begin with is this idea that um, whether you're a designer, whether you are an architect, engineer, um, again, in all these different sectors, startups, top down and bottom up, um, coming to a community, again, to Kim's point, that not everyone is willingly participating in it. Um, the idea behind a smart city is to either enhance the citizen experience or improve those city operations. And whether you choose to participate in it or not, um, you are either benefiting or being hindered by the, the city at, at large. And the way we think about technology um, centers on that, on that question of um, what is ultimately going to happen when people engage with this? Is there is it possible for us to create technology or design architecture infrastructure that even with a subset of participation um, does have a total benefit of a positive outcome for as many people as possible? Uh, this may not exactly answer the question because um, I'm I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent here as I, I tend to do, um, but. That that that's why we we start we started this company so that we could have these conversations and then uh, thusly take action based off of the information that's been gathered whether people participate or not they are generating data within the community to be utilized by those decision makers um, to ultimately benefit the community. Is there a yeah, it's collecting data on neighborhood level is great and clean feed into a city why but you still need someone to interpret the data to inform decision makers yeah mark you make a great point i'm sorry i was just reading i was just reading the chat there and you know that, that goes back to it is um interpreting that information is it's it's insanely difficult um as a data scientist uh when you receive a lot of data you have the ability to convey the message you want um not even strictly speaking about you know uh partisan interpretation, but even um, what is the narrative that we are trying to communicate to the stakeholders in general. Um, if you say we have 15 people um, that are, you know, walk, walk, walking in, walking on the street every day that are attacked in some, in some capacity, what are we, what are we going to say about that? Is that, is that a race issue, demographic issue? Is it a location issue? Is it an aggression issue? Is it a, is it a, just um, a, ment a, mental, a mental issue where we have um, people who are suffering from homelessness, aggravation, all, all these other things. And the way I'm thinking about creating this data is so that we can create this story um, collectively that we are suffering from a lot of uh, collective issues, homelessness, hunger, 
um, you know, in, insecurity of, of all of all forms, financial and others. And how can we ensure without forcing the community to participate, how can we collectively make sure that the resources that are produced actually end up in the right and right areas, whether that is investment for long-term projects or short-term initiatives to ensure that, again, people's basic needs are met. Sorry, I know I went all over the place there. Ryan, I think you, I love the way you answer questions. So I'm always just fascinated about where you go and where you take us. And I think one important thing to mention and in working in innovation for as long as I think I have, which isn't long at all, you forget what innovation really means. And it's, it's not inventing something new. Like Ryan mentioned, it's approving upon what's already existing. And I think that's what is so important about building these communities. Like we talked about earlier, it's, it's taking the components of a community and building upon it and not coming in and, and changing everything because no one's good with change. I'm not good with change. COVID's still messing with me. I'm like, this is, I am not doing well. I don't do well every day. I forget my mask half the time. I have now strapped it to my neck, but it has become one of these things where how can you take something and incorporate it into people's daily lives? And we've seen that innovation come in many different ways. I think the ring doorbell is, is one beautiful example of something didn't know we needed until we had it. And now I don't have to stock the people. I can just pull up an app, be like, cool, don't want to come to the door. Bye. So it's it's really creating this and innovating where it needs it most. And, and taking that data, data, I realized I was probably saying it wrong, but taking that information and making sure it's it's the right information is so hard. Where is it coming from? Is it a biased place? Is it you know self-serving to a company? Are they the only ones winning, winning from providing this data? And, and really making sure it's coming from a place that benefits the, the greater community as a whole. And I'm going to plug Steven Kleinberg's book one more time because it just shows how amazing Houston is. I will drop it in the chat. It, it, even the little brief description says more than I probably have said. Yeah. Hey, that's right, Jim. Let's go ahead. You have to just be responsible with, uh, with how you use it. Uh, it's, it should be collected fairly. Uh, it, we have to take a 10,000 foot approach to collecting data, making sure we're getting it from everywhere because it could say anything we want it to say if we're not looking at it iteratively if we're not looking at it equitably um nuance we learned a lot about nuanced data during the pandemic and how we wanted to report those things how we wanted to use it to make decisions so yes uh, a city will need to to interpret data and inform decision makers. Uh, but knowing what our goals are is always important. Understanding that we, we have to be transparent and we have to look at the data holistically to get us to, to where we're trying to be. If the goal is to build a building, that's one thing. But if the goal is to bring an equitable solution to a community, it may not, the data just may not show us that that's the best thing to do, right? We have to look at that and, and just not be afraid of it. The information is, is there. We just the demon, the data is not the demon. It, it really isn't. There's a question in the chat from Princeton. If you want to go ahead and ask it to the panelists. Maybe not. I can go ahead and read it. Um, hypothetically, the project had no budget. What components would create an ultimate smart building, smart city? Well, I, I just have to jump in right here and say that this is why infrastructure is so important and smart infrastructure. Um, it, someone asked me what I think, uh, what I want our city to look like 20 years from now or what I want for our city 20 years from now. And I want some sustainability here. I want the city not to be dependent on other people to be able to deliver those kinds of solutions. So that is infrastructure. Um, the refreshes, the investments um, and other countries do a much better job of investing in technology infrastructure than we do in the United States. That's just a proven fact. We, we are behind in, in those things and we've got to make this infrastructure available. Um, and then we can do those small things and without a large budget project, we could start delivering some smart 
solutions and solutions that really benefit folk without having to ask for money all of the time. And a city, a cash strapped city just can't be in that position. So I'd like to see us make some strategic investments in smart infrastructure and in infrastructure and understanding what those things are. Yeah, I think infrastructure is, in, is incredibly important for, for any city, right? It's, you know, the foundation of which, um, which we all, which we're all living. Um, assuming that this um, ultimate smart city project, you know, again, if we can take care of all the infrastructure, we still have uh, funding left over. I, I would then look to how are we going to ensure that th those needs are, are being met that the, that the city is dealing with when it's looking at um, job training, when you're looking at homelessness, education, when you're looking at uh, healthcare, childcare, um, food deserts. Um, all, all of those issues as well. The smart city, again, those, those two critical pieces is we need to improve city operations, making sure that we have um, running water, making sure that we have good we have good streets, people can go from point A to point B. But then looking at the long-term impacts of highways is, uh, is creating a highway, again, enhancing a, a redlining, enhancing this division in certain communities when certain areas are gonna continuously not receive resources where others are. When looking at once the infrastructure is built, how is this contributing to or diminishing the and the inefficiencies and inequality that exists within a city so i i would say it's it's a couple of things it's creating ways to get information from everyone within the city uh, and how can we interpret that information such that we can create these short-term uh, initiatives with with these long-term solutions so not just creating um, 50 nonprofits to distribute food, let's figure out why we have such a, a food supply issue to begin with. It, it's not just creating more, more buildings, you know, to put homeless people in. It, it's how are people, how are so many people experiencing homelessness at the same time? Is it something that we can do differently with our education, with our, with our training, with our infrastructure to ensure that uh, people don't fall, you know, uh, fall victim to, to these different circumstances. Um, the, the, the smart city, there's, there's so many definitions for what makes a city a smart city. But again, to me, it's if we, the components are that infrastructure, uh, that technology that then sits upon it. And then lastly, our engagement with that, which includes everyday people, just either giving, receiving, participating in the consumption or distribution of this data, but then also those policy changes. What can we do differently within our legal sector? What can we do differently within legislation to ensure that you know, we're putting these guardrails on the human experience such that, hey, we're, you can't com be completely foul, right? But we're not gonna tell you everything how to live your life. We need to make sure that, again, people's needs are being met while also not limiting and inhabiting you know, um, these, uh, the, the, the individual freedoms and liberties people have. You know, it's just, it's kind of finding that balance. How can we, make a smart city that makes every action you take completely equitable for everybody. I mean, that's a utopia. Uh, one can dream, but I, I think it really starts with, um, like, like Kim said, that infrastructure and then um, getting that technology together so that we can have that conversation to figure out what are those next steps. Corey, I know we have three minutes and I just have something really quick to add and I promise I'll be brief. So in this conversation, um, we've had the amazing opportunity at the ION, um, our director and I, to work with Galveston. And that is one of our, you know, coastal cities. And it actually is one of the biggest ports um, in the U.S., I think. Don't quote me on that. I I'm, I'm keep sounding like Houston's this amazing place when it took me two years to like it. So I'm sorry. But um, we've had this amazing opportunity to create this innovation ecosystem from the ground up. And you would think all it takes is someone with the money or the idea, right? Right? Well, actually, no, we've created a collective with them that includes the universities that are there. It includes the city, the chamber. It, it's a collective of about 12 different organizations in the city of Galveston coming together and say, we know we need a place for innovation. We need a place for entrepreneurs and we don't have it. We don't wanna recreate the wheel. Houston has this, how can we be a part of it? But how can it be true to what we're doing? Infrastructure is the first thing. I know that getting together in a place isn't what we wanna do or can do right now at the moment, but it doesn't neglect the fact that they're going to need a home at some point and they're gonna need a place to go and, and build this community 
by themselves and, and really be, have a fostered environment. So it's making sure that you have a champion and someone also who's very connected to the community and really taking this and building it and, and bringing that all together and bringing it, starting it from scratch, you are gonna make so many wrong choices and so many bumps along the way, but it is all about finding out and, and figuring it out with one another and, and having the people that are going to stand by it, even if it doesn't succeed the first time. Look at that, two minutes to spare. That's perfect. You would not believe how many times cities leave out in, uh, in uh, universities in their in higher education. Uh, you got to make sure you have everyone at the table. You would think that that would be one of the first places that we go, and it really isn't. So, coming in there. Ones with the grant. <laughs> They're the ones with the money. <laughs> go to them. <laughs> they are the people that have the, done the research and have the money and are willing to participate in. Plus, they have free researchers, aka students, that can help everyone along the way. <laughs> <We're learning. laughs> and you know, I think that that again, we are out of time. This is such a great conversation and but I do think that's also a great place to, to, to kind of stop the conversation in that at the end of the day so much of our ability to move forward um, in, in this progression this evolution of smart cities really comes down to the systems that we put in place the infrastructure the frameworks we put in place but really just acknowledging and listening to the needs of uh, of, of people, right? And at the end of the day, that, that is the service that we provide. Um, whether we work in, in government or, or architecture or engineering or um, well, really any, any, any um, profession that it is out there should serve the betterment of all people. And so um, that really does start with collaboration and engagement. Um, and I think that that the smart city of the future really does come down to that opportunity to give everyone a platform to be heard, to be engaged, to gain access to what is happening in their community, whether it's local uh, or, or you know, to the city or to a county. You know, I think there's, there's obviously different scales to this, but at the end of the day, that access and that engagement or opportunity for engagement um, is foundational to anything that we put in place. And I think that's a great place for us to think of, you know, getting everyone to the table is how we provide um, any sense of, of equity um, and resiliency and sustainability in our communities because they go hand in hand. Um, otherwise, we, we end up in, in situations like we are now where it isn't a sustainable community because of the conflicts because of the inaccessibility or the uh, inequality that's built into the systems. And so with that future, um, there's a ton of opportunity, but it's, it's clear from today's conversation that, that there's, there's a ton of challenges and a ton of risks that we face. Um, in closing up for the day, um, you know, today is, is both a daunting day to set the context and the conversation for interventions that are happening or could be or will be happening to move us towards um, realizing uh, smarter cities. Um, but I, I think it's also, um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's such an optimistic conversation because the, the reality is we have nothing but opportunity, it's, it's how we choose to use that opportunity moving forward. Um, and I, I do think that the design professions, uh, whether you're a developer or um, in the building department or an architect or an engineer, um, the more we start to think about our work in the context of users, in the context of um, the wellness and health of users, um, I think we, we fulfill that responsibility, not a role, but the, the true obligation of what we're meant to do uh, as a profession or what we're obligated to do as a profession. Um, and to me, that is, uh, that's, that's a pretty incredible place to be, to, to be given not only the, the responsibility of that, but um, 
the good faith that we can follow through on it. So um, yeah, I, today was such a great day. I have to thank all of the panelists for your time and your expertise. Um, it is it is just, um, it, it's really an honor to, to sit here and have this conversation with you. Um, and I look forward tomorrow to tomorrow's conversation and tomorrow's panels uh, as we explore a little bit more uh, the tactical aspects of, of how we can move in a direction um, towards smarter, better cities. And Will, I can hand it over to you now. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thank you very much, everybody. Uh, join us again tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and then as we sort of take everyone off mute, we want to do a final round of applause for all the speakers. But I also want to especially thank our sponsors of the program. Our, our presenting sponsor today was LG. Um, our champion sponsor was Supporting Strategies. Our media sponsor was Arconnect. And we had participating sponsorship from Hunter Douglas Architecture, from HKS, and Anderson Barker Architects. So thank you so much. Let's uh, unmute ourselves and... Uh, Get back to work, everybody. Thank you so much for an excellent program, Corey. You did a great job.